why would you want an external antenna tuner if you've got a built-in one in your transceiver? I'm going to have a look at the LDG AT100. It's 125 watt ATU. Let's see what advantages it might give you over the internal tuner in your radio. Hello and welcome back once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. We'll talk about or have a look at the LDG AT100, which has been around for a little while, but it's a very attractive item. It's an external antenna tuner rated at 125 watts, so it will match most of the uh, popular base stations. And uh, it's got some interesting features. By the way, I hope you're keeping in touch with our Facebook uh, channel. Uh, we uh, do uh, put quite a lot of uh, posts up on our Facebook channel, as you can see here. Uh, one or two of the recent ones, so uh, do keep in touch and there's a link on our website to the Facebook channel and I'll try and remember to put a link below uh, this video as well. Now, antenna tuners or antenna matchers, uh, it's always a little bit of a hot potato that uh, when you talk about ATUs to uh, some people, but anyway, I think most people know what we mean by an antenna tuner. An antenna tuner is designed to enable your transceiver to deliver power to your antenna. Now some antennas present a nice clean load to the transceiver, there are 50 ohms, no reactants, uh, resonant and low SWR etc. So you don't need an antenna tuner. But there are many occasions when the antenna doesn't present quite as good a match as the transceiver would like. Now a lot of these matches that are presented to the transceiver, they're not they're not really problems except to the transceiver, provided you can match that uh, um, impedance or reactance to the transceiver, then the transceiver will quite happily deliver power. And this is done by an antenna tuner, which has got some clever things inside it, which enables the transceiver to deliver power to your antenna. Now, most of the popular um, antenna tuners, what we call L-match, and I'll put a a basic drawing up on the screen. Now you see an L match is very simple, there's not much to it really. The clever part is all the switching that goes on in the antenna tuner. It has got a, a wide range of inductances and capacitors to select and it keeps working away until it finds the best match possible. And really and truly that is where one antenna tuner differs from another. The antenna tuner in your transceiver will match quite a few different loads, but it has its limitations. External tuners are able to match a much wider range of impedances and reactances, and this is one of the uh, uh, plus points of having an external tuner. It is, it is a very capable item of equipment. Anyway, before we uh, <coughs> go any further, let's have a look at the outside of the uh, LDG AT100 and see uh, what it has to offer. The unit is somewhat smaller than from the photos I'd seen of it. It measures 20 centimetres deep by 15 centimetres wide by 5 centimetres high. The front panel is where all the action takes place. On the right hand side there are two bar graphs. The upper one is for the power, the lower one is for the VSWR. There's an internal antenna selector so the LED on the bottom right shows whether antenna 2 or antenna 1 is selected. And on the left hand side it shows whether the ATU is in circuit or bypassed. The top bar graph can be switched to read 0 to 125 watts or 0 to 12.5 watts, the latter being good if you're running low power QRP etc. On the left hand side we've got the control area with a series of buttons. There's no on off button, the unit is live as soon as you connect power to it. Most of the buttons are multi-function. There is a primary function, a secondary function, and in some cases a third function if you hold the button in for an extended period of time. On the rear, you've got two antenna connections, the connection from the unit back to your transceiver, a DC socket, uh, if they supply a generous length of cable, about two meters long, 
and then there is also a remote socket. A number of the current ICOM radios have provision for connecting to an external ATU and LDG provide an optional interconnecting cable. Likewise, some of the Yesu radios also have a similar facility and again LDG provide an optional interface cable. There's a lot to learn about the AT100 Pro, so I suggest downloading the manual. It makes it much easier to read and of course you can do a quick search on a particular item. There's a number of bar graph displays which are worth remembering. And what I do is I take a screenshot on my iPad and I can quickly refer to them. In order to activate the tuning on the LDG, you need some form of RF and you really need a continuous form of RF. What I do is I normally switch to either AM or FM and briefly press the transmit button. Now, you're not transmitting FM or AM unless you're speaking to the microphone. If you just key the microphone on FM or AM without speaking into the microphone, you're just generating a steady carrier. So I've selected FM on here and I'll press the button and the ATU is now tuning. and it is found a good match. Now it is important first of all to check the channel before you transmit. Secondly, to reduce your power to around about three or four watts because this tuner will quite happily tune with just a few watts, just two or three watts, it'll happily tune. So you don't need a lot of power and that minimizes even more the interference that you might cause. And once of course it's tuned, these, re these relays are latching relays. So once it's tuned, they lock on and they'll stay there. You could even switch the ATU off and that tuning position would be maintained. On the far left, we've got the function control. We press it once, that indicates it's on. Press it again, that indicates it's off. Now we press it and leave it after about four or five seconds, it switches itself off. And as you'd expect, when you press the function control, it selects the legends below each of the buttons. In the manual mode, you can actually manually tune this uh, AT100. You can select the capacitors going up or down in value. You can select the inductors going up or down in value. And every time you press it, it goes up and down just like that. And if you hold it, it will continually go up or down, which is quite handy. On the far left, you've got the antenna switch, uh, antenna one and antenna two. When antenna one is selected, that LED is out. And when antenna two is selected, that LED is on. The tune button is multifunction. If you press the function key there, then you'll have the ability to store a particular setting in the memory. But if you hold this button for between half and two and a half seconds, you'll see that display come on there, which you probably saw just flash up on the screen. That means that when you select tune, it will actually look for a memory that's already been set up for that particular frequency. If you hold it in for a bit longer, you now get that display and that indicates that it's going to do a complete refresh tune. So in other words, it's going to start from scratch and look for the best um, combination. And one other function of this button is if you just tap it very briefly, you switch between the ATU in circuit and the ATU out of circuit. Let's now have a look at the secondary functions of the buttons. Top, you've got peak and that selects between peak power and average power indication. Then you've got scale. The scale, the power scale is either 0 to 125 watts or 0 to 12 and a half watts. That makes it very good for QRP operation, things like the IC705, KX2, KX3, etc. On the bottom row, we've got something which says high, low, Z, which stands for high, low impedance. With the standard L network um, circuit diagram, which I showed you, you can have it configured in two ways. 
you either have the inductance after the C or the inductance before the C. Basically, what it means is to say that you can select either impedances from 50 ohms down to 6 ohms or impedances from 50 ohms up to 1000 ohms when you're manual tuning. Then we've got auto. In auto mode, the tuner is permanently in circuit and if it senses a change of VSWR, it will tune itself. So it's constantly on guard. VSWR starts to go up, it will tune itself. If you go to the manual mode, then it will only retune itself when you instruct it to. And then finally, we've got threshold. Threshold means to say that you can decide when the tuner will start to retune itself. If you're in auto mode, the tuner will look for the threshold, which might be 1.2 to 1 or 1.3 to 1 or 1.4 to 1. And when it senses that the VSWR arises, rises above that threshold, then it will start to tune itself. The power reading is pretty accurate. I've uh, set the transceiver so that the power meter reads 10 watts because I'm on the low scale and the transceiver has actually been set to 11 watts so a little bit give or take there but it's pretty accurate. Now I've set the transceiver to full power and you see we're getting an indication of uh, 100 watts. I've now set the IC7300 which I'm using for this test to 50 watts and there we are, we've got uh, 50 watts out so I'm pretty happy with that. And once you've found your way around all the buttons, it starts to become pretty intuitive. The unit has 4,000 memories. What actually happens is it remembers a frequency and the combination of LC that was used in order to match it. And if you go back to that frequency, the first thing it does is it visits the library to see if it's got that frequency and the right combination in. And if it has got that combination, it's almost instantaneous. If not, then it will go through the tuning procedure, which usually takes around about two seconds. Uh, Golf Bravo 100 uh, BBC from Golf 3 Oscar, Juliet Victor. Yeah, very good um, afternoon to you. Thanks for the, coming back to the call. Name is Peter, Papa Echo Tango Echo Romeo, QTH is near Southland on Sea from Golf 3 Oscar, Juliet Victor. Yeah, no problem at all. Hello there, uh, Peter. Lovely to hear you today. Good signal from uh, Southend. Oh, thank you very much uh, for the. Uh, the unit comes with a very useful and informative uh, manual. Quite a few pages and some interesting things right at the back explaining how ATUs work. And if you really uh, want to find out the ins and outs of how it all works, then uh, there's some interesting stuff there. It's a very capable tuner and I should add that uh, although this is called the AT100 which is rated at 100 watts they do a 200 watt version a 600 watt version and a thousand watt version so it caters for all power levels and of course for QRP the AT100 is great because you can reduce the full scale to 12 and a half watts which is very handy so do you want one I mean I know that a lot of people are going to say, well, why do I need an external antenna tuner if I've got an internal one in my transceiver? Well, yes, it's a valid point. So let's see what you actually get. Well, first of all, you get quite a handy uh, dual antenna switch. And I think that most HF operators have more than one antenna. And if they don't, they'd find it handy to have a dummy load so they could switch to a dummy load to do some testing and so forth. So. A two-way kayak switch is a, a valuable asset. Secondly, you do have a digital VSWR power meter, which again is quite nice. And I think there's something about having that, that indication right in front of you. You can see right in front of you uh, the power coming out, the VSWR, whether you're transmitting or not on the power level. I think you, know, you, you can focus on that. It's very, it's very instantaneous and if there was any problem with VSWR I think you'd probably instantly notice it. And of course the fact is that a lot of antenna tuners inside transceivers have only got a limited capability. There are exceptions, the Ellicraft K3 series and I think probably the K4 have got a very wide range in internal ATU 
And some of the Zigu uh, transceivers got quite capable ATUs, but a lot of transceivers have limitations, and therefore, if you have an external antenna tuner, then you do have a wider um, matching range. Another thing, of course, is that this antenna tuner will only match unbalanced loads. In other words, it will only feed coax systems. And I know some of you would think, well, that's a bit of a limitation because I use balanced feeder or I might want to use balanced feeder. Well, there's an easy answer and that is to use an external ballon. Now, I know that it means to say you've got to have an external ballon, but just bear in mind that most of the current ATUs that offer balanced feed have simply got a ballon inside them. Sometimes an external ballon is more useful because a lot of people don't want to bring their twin feeder, their balance line, into the radio room. It's a bit awkward to do. Uh, you've got to have drill holes in the wall, etc., etc. Much easier if you can have that ballon outside. So if you're going to have to have a ballon outside, you might as well have an antenna tuner unit that doesn't have a ballon inside because you're just doubling up on your assets and you're only going to use one, which is the one outside. So the fact that you need to add an external ballon is no bad idea, really. And then what about end-fed wires? Well, personally, I'm never that happy about bringing an end-fed wire right into the radio room, into an antenna machine unit. You can get all sorts of problems. You can get uh, live chassis, RF, etc., etc., flying around. And certainly, if you're going to run high power, I would say no. Don't even entertain the idea of an end-fed wire where it's terminated at the antenna tuner inside the radio room. It can cause all sorts, sorts of problems, believe me. If you want to use an end-fed wire, then get yourself something like a 9 to 1 Anon. I know people frown upon them, but they do work. In fact, I heard a station um, only this morning putting out a very good signal with a 9 to 1 Anon on 40 metres with just 30 foot of wire. So it can work. So all in all, the fact that it's unbalanced only is not really too much of a drawback. Ultimately, it's your choice. But what I would say is that the LDG antenna tuning units are very well made. They're very well documented. The documentation is extremely good and there's a lot of additional information and so forth that you might want to read about matching antennas, etc. It goes quite deeply into it. It does the job. So that's the AT100 from LDG. I hope that I've given you all the information that you need. I'm sure I may have left one or two points out, but I've tried to cover everything. I've enjoyed using it, I could live with it, and um, it's really down to you to decide whether you could live with it. So, thank you for watching this video. Much appreciate your support on this uh, video channel. It's uh, very much appreciated. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy your ham radio. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.